great. Uh, as an in inauguration seminar for, for like Rice AI's um, learning machines here in Gothenburg, uh, I just thought we'd start with, with the image of like the crowd here. So you can see four people, but there are actually four more there. So we're actually eight people here, plus me, that's nine. Big crowd. Um, so we have a few guys from, from Ericsson. We have a few guys from Chalmers, a few guys from Rice Victoria, Cooperative Systems. And uh, Gothenburg University. And um, so I'll just turn around the camera, also known as my computer. And we'll see if that can function. Like something like this, right? I'm in picture and, and everybody's happy. So I have no remote control, uh, but It'll have to, it'll have to be. All right, so welcome here, everybody here, and welcome everybody in Stockholm. Um, I will today talk about ITML um, in the emails. Perhaps it sounded like I'm going to talk about conditional neural processes. And that is also the case. It was a presentation at ICML this year, and uh, and it just happens to be so that my slides, have, uh, the 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 title of my slides is ICML this year, and and uh, I just thought I'd begin with with some of the uh, things that I thought was was nice. Uh, so I have a few papers uh, in the deep learning sessions. Uh, most of them are uh, transfer learning or domain adaptation. Uh, nature and one of them is is the paper that I will present today uh, conditional neural processes by Garnello et al uh, from DeepMind um, also uh, nice things was uh, the keynote by Max Welling about power efficient machine learning and uh, uh, this uh, tutorial by Sanjeev Arora uh, toward theoretical understanding of deep learning or one of the main points is it was actually presented in the talk later at the conference uh, on the optimization of deep networks, implicit acceleration by over parameterization, where you talk about why is it that, that we actually can learn so large networks, so deep networks, as we actually do. Um, uh, I'll be talking about that in two weeks, uh, but today, uh, well, after showing this nice picture about where we are, uh, this arrow is pointing fairly close to closely outside our window here. Uh, so this is where we are, and Rise AI here is John and it's me, and we look like this. We're these apparently we're these outdoor type people with with like woods and and uh, mountains in the back in in the background. So this is who we are, and this is where we where we are. Right, so without further ado, conditional neural processes. Have people read the paper? Skim the paper? Some people. So we'll take it from the beginning. It's a paper about, about an idea of, of uh, training neural networks so that they, in some way, um, in some way uh, work like uh, a Gaussian process. They take much of, much of their inspiration from Gaussian processes, and we'll see how how much that that resemblance <clears throat> is actually there in practice. Uh, we model a distribution over functions, um, and we'll define what a stochastic process is in a moment. Uh, <clears throat> we can use uh, a trained model to estimate a function, or actually do a few shot. Uh, function estimation, where we give a few samples uh, that are labeled, and then a few uh, target query points uh, where, that we want to evaluate from the function. And, and it actually managed to do this in, a, in just a few examples. Also nice, we don't have to construct any manual priors, uh, in contrast to the, the original Gaussian processes, and it's also a, a very, very 
uh, efficient method in, in at test time as compared to Gaussian processes. Right? So we're modeling a stochastic process, or at least that, that's how they want to look at this. It's it's not a miles wide difference between between this and, and supervised learning, but we'll we'll go into the details about about how this is similar and how this is different. Uh, so we have a stochastic process. Uh, in this process, we have some observations. Those are x i y i, uh, and those are a mapping from from x to y. We also have a number of targets. These are considered uh, the unlabeled examples uh, because the model is not allowed to see the y i's here. Uh, so these are the data that are input to to the model. Uh, and the difference between O and T here is, uh, of course, in, in, in the indices here. So from N to N plus M, uh, those are the targets. And the first N elements, those are, those are the observations, which are labeled, and you can see the labels. Uh, so we'd like to model this probability distribution over functions. So we have functions from X to Y. Uh, and we don't only want to learn exactly one function, but we'd like to learn the probability distribution over these functions. And then what P is, it's, it's this uh, joint probability distribution over these outputs, F of Xi. That is, that is what we're modeling. And that can also be seen as a conditional or of the probability of the output f of t uh, given o and t, which are the observations and the, the targets. Targets here it can be a misleading term. Uh, the target is uh, a set of xi's. So these are, these are kind of more the query points, which we ask what, what, what is the output. I, I think it becomes much more clearer when you look at this, this model overview. Um, the, the projector here in Gothenburg is, is a bit weak on the top, but, but those are shaded and, and the top line here isn't the important line. The top line is just the data. We have X, we have Y, and we have mappings from X to Y. So that's, that's, that's uh, just the basic data setup. And if you train a model in, with supervised training, that's the middle line here, we have uh, uh, a model where we where we model this G here. Uh, we train the G uh, approximator with the data from X on, X1 to Y1, from X2 to Y2, and so on. And when we predict, we just use this trained G uh, to make predictions on, on the held out data, such as X4, we predict the Y4, and hopefully it works. So we, we have trained this G in the supervised setting. Now, in, in this stochastic process setting, uh, we instead have a little more complicated setup where we have the important things here are to the H's, the R's, and, and the G's. And H and G are modeled as neural net networks. And throughout the paper, they use a number of different networks that are, that are suited to different tasks as we will see. Um, so what they do is H takes one X and one Y as input. And it learns to produce uh, some intermediate representation R. So from X1 and Y1, we get this representation R1. Now, from a number of such examples from the observation set O, uh, we take this, these representations and we, we uh, put them together uh, with some, some, some simple kind of, of aggregation uh, and we get this R without the subscript that is then used by another neural network model G uh, to make the predictions. So now this, this G takes input X4 and R and produces the output Y4. Now, so we have, we have kind of 
a few new steps of indirection here, which means that we can take these observations as a demonstrator of, of what is the function that, that we're trying to, to see right now, and we can make predictions from kind of that function. Now, during training, we have, of course, observations. We have uh, these targets. Uh, and with targets, they mean uh, these inputs to the Gs, the X4, X5, X6. Uh, but obviously, we also have Y4, Y5, Y6. And we can measure the, the, the empirical error. And we can use backprop to train the whole thing uh, end to end. Questions? So, can you verify how this last line, how it doesn't fit into putting all this into G, but uh, so, so why is not the last line the same as the, as the second line? Why is this not uh, supervised learning? Well, uh, the thing is that at test time, you can have an observation set that was not there at training time. So we train this having one observation set and one target set. Uh, but then at test time, uh, we have a held out observation set that can, in, in a way, that is considered to be another function from the distribution of functions. Um, right. Then Q theta is what we call our, our model of the stochastic process. This Q theta is what we train to, to model P, which is the distribution over, over functions. Uh, and to make this permutation invari invariable, is that a word? We'll, we would like to have permutation invariance, at least. Uh, so, so the order where, where in which we input these uh, these uh, inputs, it shouldn't matter, and and this is enforced by having these as as a factored structure. So each uh, each uh, f of x for each each x, uh, we have we have the output of of the whole target set. Uh, modeled as a probability, and that is Q theta. So if we have several x's in the, in the target set, uh, then, uh, then we have this product which, which yields the, the probability in them. Right. Um, so the, the R's, uh, I said they're aggregated, and in this paper they aggregated only by, by using the means. So they use the mean of these representations, which is um, surprising that, that it works so well. You could, you could imagine having a, a, a recurrent neural network or something, uh, but here they use, they use only the mean uh, of the representations, the R1, R2, R3 here, uh, which aggregate to this R. So we have this as a fixed representation of the observation set. Right, what more one did I want to say about this? Well, we, we have this, we'd like to do the predictions of the target set and condition on this, this observation set. And then we'd like to have this, this fixed size representation of the, of the O. Well, each here, I'm guessing, are fairly small models. So you have uh, a lots and lots of weak learners, I guess. It depends. Uh, I don't think you have to have them as a, as a small model. Um, but but it's the same model. Uh, there's no subscript of an age, so so you you share you share the same model, and it takes one one uh, data point as an input, and you get one uh, corresponding representation for each uh, for each uh, data point. Uh, so it's an embedding function, the age, and the G is is sometimes called the decoder function. So so you can see it as an encoder decoder. Uh, it's actually very simple to do translation models and, and uh, like image captioning and, and stuff like that. Um, 
Right. Both H and G are, of course, uh, uh, parameterized as, as neural networks. Uh, and, and thus, the whole thing is a neural network. Um, are there more clarifications? Uh, well, there are, there are related things. Uh, this is, of course, very related to Gaussian processes, where you, you specify your Gaussian kernels, uh, and, then, and then at test time, uh, you, you input your, your, your data points, and it starts to, to become more and more confident about, what, about the function. And this is often visualized using this 1D regression, which we will see in a minute here. Um, this is uh, a bit more costly computationally than the neural, uh, neural process model. Uh, it's cubic in, in the number of the inputs. M here is the observation set, and M is the, is the target set, I think. Uh, it also limits the expressivity uh, depending on, on what kind of kernels you're using. Uh, this is also very related to meta-learning. You have this large data set where you kind of learn to learn something, and you have these, these um, uh, kind of the, the, the target task, if you wish, uh, where you're doing the, the actual prediction again. That's also very closely related to few-shot learning, or it actually is few-shot learning, uh, and you can compare them to matching networks. Uh, some of the experiments are here compared to matching networks, uh, in which you're all also kind of computing this, this representation for a data point, and then you're comparing these representations. Uh, but the comparison kernel is, is hard-coded, and, and this, the, the neural processes model is a bit more general uh, in, in the way that it can learn the comparisons. Uh, you will also see in the experiments in a minute that, that uh, this is kind of used as, as a generative model, but it's a bit more flexible uh, in that it can generate things of different uh, resolutions, and, and, uh, and they have some results on that as well. Right, so for the first result, uh, that is the, the, this, this famous uh, 1D regression, where you, you kind of always see this uh, with Gaussian processes. Uh, so the data set here is actually generated from a Gaussian process. The top two lines uh, is generated using, uh, using one Gaussian process, and the bottom line here is, generating, uh, is generated using, uh, using a number of different, I think two different Gaussian processes here. And then you have uh, a switching uh, where, you, where you switch kernels. And I think it is in the middle. It looks a bit like it may, makes some kind of a jump in the middle here. Um, so the, the, the left column here is with, is with five context points, and the right column is with 50 context points, and that's the context points, that's the observations. So if you show it five uh, data points of, of, on the line, uh, uh, and the first line here is, is the actual baseline. That's a Gaussian process uh, with, they say, optimal hyperparameters, so it should be able to, to learn uh, fairly well. What, what is the, the underlying process that we're looking for. Um, and this can, can then be compared with the second line, which is a neural uh, process that learns with the exact same points and the exact same underlying uh, generating process. Uh, and you can see that the neural process isn't exactly as smooth, uh, but it, it keeps on learning. And, and at 50 context points, the result is perhaps comparative. Seems to make some error here after one. And uh, also the, the, the kind of this, um, this uh, visualization of the variance is, is also not so smooth with the neural network. Uh, but it does the job. It learns uh, the function. In the bottom line here, um, they don't have baseline. And the reason for that I don't really know, but perhaps it doesn't really make sense to try to, to learn uh, a function where you're switching kernels uh, with a Gaussian process where you cannot really switch kernels. Uh, but the point is that, that the neural process actually manages to, to follow one, one D line in the beginning and then continue to following it 
after after they run their wave switch kernels. Uh, and with few context points um, on the left bottom here, uh, we have a fairly large uh, standard deviation around the line uh, before it starts to learn. I guess that's consistent with, with the other, other uh, pictures as well. So the blue line in the middle, that, that's the that's a neural process and the and the red line in the in the top pictures, those are Gaussian process. Yes, question. Okay, so you're showing also the uncertainty here. Is there a cross form expression for that I like to get in Gaussian process? Or how how is the computer? Um so I don't think they actually specify this, but I do think that it is modeled as as um, a parameterized output. It, it is modeled as, as an actual Gaussian output, where you, you just directly model, you, you output the mean and you output the, the, uh, the right, so like two functions standard deviation. To estimate the mean function and that's the Yes, function. you get you get two outputs for each, uh, for each, um, for each output. Makes sense. Yes. Um, that's how I imagine that they do it. Uh, but of course, for the for the Gaussian process, it's already there. Right? Are there questions from from the, the other office? No, okay. I guess there are also no complaints. So so we'll just go on, right? Right. So the second experiment here is the MNIST image completion. Perhaps it's better I stand on this side. Um, so. This is modeled. Uh, the axes are, are two dimensional. You get 2D coordinates on where on the image would like to predict uh, the function value. So we have a two dimensional function here. Um, and the, the targets are, are, are the y's, I should say, not to, to mix the, the terminology. The axes are coordinates, and the y's, that's the pixel intensity. We have grayscale image images, so the intensity is just. Uh, is just an intensity, uh, scalar intensity, and and from seeing one context point on the furthest left, uh, oh, so, so we just have two different data points here. So that so the left four uh, columns here is that's that's the number one, right? And the 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 next four columns here that's the number nine. And if you give it if you give it the first column, if you give it one pixel, uh, you, you cannot really predict that much. Then we get a mean output that's a really a combination of all digits, perhaps something like that. And the variance is, is very high all over the all, all over the place. If you give it forty points, you can actually start to to see that it predicts some kind of a of a one. It's a kind of a a, a slope of a straight line. And with 200 points, that's still much fewer than the whole picture, uh, and that's that's in this in this terminology, the function is the image, and 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 so each point here is one pixel, and the the value of that pixel is the valuation of that function. So with 200 points, you can you can actually make out the number fairly well, and with Many more points, 784. It's uh, the, the variants have, have kind of shrimped much more. Can you just explain uh, what is the structure of the training set? So, yes. uh, each x is one pixel or one image? Each x is one is one pixel. And this is, this is one of the things that I have uh, kind of an issue with this paper because one function is one image uh -huh. here. Uh, so, the whole training data for this experiment, that is the whole MNIST, except yeah. for some held out, uh, held out uh, digits. Uh, and each image is considered one, one function here. Uh, uh, so and you can it. kind of debate whether that's uh, a kind of, kind of this general training data. But, if but, it's general but, but uh, when, the, I mean, the full training set consists of uh, several Functions then. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, 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 so the, the MNIST dataset, yeah. you have thousands of, of 
of functions, yes. Yeah. Uh, and each such function, you have inputs, um, which are two-dimensional, which is the coordinates of, of this picture. They're normalized from zero to one. Yeah, I, I, I uh, cannot r resolve this completely with your definition in the beginning, where you said mm -hmm. that the training set consists of a bunch of labeled points. I mean, it's more like uh, the training set consists of uh, let's say examples of functions or something like this. Yes, but the examples of the functions. More hierarchical. The except, yeah, I guess you can say that. I, the examples, the training points, the, the functions in the training data, they are they are demonstrated by these pixel values. So you get a number of of, uh, of coordinates. Yeah, but it's not that you put all all coordinates into let's say one big bucket. I mean, they are still no. kind of grouped. They are grouped per function. Yes. So you train it on a set of functions in that in that sense. I mean, that makes sense. And from, from kind of each training uh, iteration, you have a function, and you take some data points from that function, and you can learn these representations for that. And the nice thing, nice thing is that these representations, uh, you can actually use them to, to query the model with, with numbers or here functions uh, that you haven't seen before. And oh yeah, these informed observations, uh, that's actually another experiment. Uh, so building on this, this experiment, uh, they look at the variance and they start picking, um, picking observation points based on where the variance is high. Uh, and when you start doing that, uh, you, can, you can get a much, much uh, better, uh, here it's log prob. Uh, you get much better performance from fewer samples if you allow the model to to uh, choose where to pick where to pick these um, observation points. Okay. Now, this this uh, experiment is is almost the same thing. Now we have three-dimensional output, which is red, green, blue. Uh, so we have colored pixel, pixels, and perhaps the functions are a bit more smooth. Um, so perhaps it's more difficult because it's high-dimensional, higher dimensionality, but uh, it's probably also easier because it's smoother. Um, so we again have this input uh, x, which is the 2D coordinates, and we have the y, uh, which is 3D RGB and intensities. And uh, I guess you can see the same pattern here. Uh, the trained model, which has seen these, uh, this Celeb A data set, it contains pictures of, of celebrities, photos, I guess. They're all from, from like portraits. Uh, and so already with, with one pixel, you actually get something that looks like it looks something like uh, a portrait. So it's probably some kind of a mean over, over the data set or something. You, you often have eyes and you have a mouth there. And the variance is, is of course, varying uh, most, mostly in the points where, where you have most variability, like around the eyes and around the, the edges of the head and, and so on. Uh, and with 10 points, uh, the face is much more clear, but I don't think it's it's it doesn't really resemble the same face, right? It starts to see that it is a face, which was kind of clear from the beginning because it's is trained, and that that's again my my kind of reservation with this paper. It is trained on the function set that is images of portraits of celebrities. That is how it's trained right now. So the functions are from a pixel coordinate to its value, uh, and it's always these portraits. Why do, you, why do you say you have a reservation? Because it's a fairly limited set of functions, right? And, and uh, they don't really discuss that, that in the paper. But of course, you have to have limitations somewhere, and, and I still think it's, it's pretty cool results. 
Uh, and it's all these kind of where you can, can interpolate. So you can go for, from this course uh, without much information and you go, you have more and more information and, and you have more and more of, of a picture to predict. Um, that's a nice thing, I think. Right, so they have some numbers in the paper. Uh, there are not, not much. Uh, much of it is, is actually qualitative uh, evaluations, uh, but they have this K nearest neighbor uh, baseline, which performs worse on all these uh, image completion tasks. And then you have the, the Gaussian processes uh, applied on the same data set, the same task, uh, which actually uh, works the best with, with a large uh, context. So if you have a thousand pixels in this image, well, you, you saw what, what happened with, with uh, I'll go back to the previous slide. If you have a thousand pixels, that's almost all the pixels. There are a few black, black ones which the model needs to fill in, but that's it. And you can surely get a fairly good, I mean, K nearest neighbors should, should work fairly well as well, uh, as well there. And, uh, and the Gaussian process uh, is even better, right? But with fewer, fewer, number of, fewer numbers of pixels in the, in the context, and context is the same thing as observed set of data points, right? Uh, so when, when you're given uh, fewer numbers, you actually improve on the results as measured by pixel-wise uh, mean squared error, which I guess is, is kind of a, a non-informative way, but, but it's, it's something. Right, this, this is perhaps an, an one of the nice points about this. Uh, so what you can do um, by modeling this, th it this way, the coordinates are modeled by a 2D vector. Uh, it's normalized between 0 and 1. Uh, so you can que query the model at any point between 0 and 1. And that means that you can actually get an arbitrary resolution. Uh, so uh, here you have a random, random context on the bottom line here. Uh, and, and then you make the prediction, and you can choose how many points you want to sample from it. So in the, on the right part here, you have sampled many points. In the middle one, you have sampled uh, not as many. And, and in the left line here, you have a really uh, coarse, uh, res with, with an image with really coarse resolution, right? Big pixels. And, and you can kind of choose which one to, to, to use here. Of course, the representations aren't infinitely uh, informative. so so. Uh, it gets blurrier, even though you have values for each of these high-resolution pixels. It, it gets blurry. Um, you can you can choose where to pick the context. And on the top line here, you have you have picked uh, half images, and on the bottom line, you have picked random pixels. Uh, and you just input each pixel as one data point, as as kind of demonstrating this um, the the function that is an image. Right, so the next experiment that is, uh, that is using a latent variable, and this is very much like uh, a variational autoencoder. It's trained as, an, as a variational autoencoder with the variational lower bound. Uh, we use these Rs, and we, we consider them to be parameters in a Gaussian uh, distribution. So for each uh, dimension, we have one parameter with, that is the mean, and one parameter that, that's the that's the variance of, of that dimension. And then we can sample from the R, and we can get uh, uh, this Z, which is the latent variable, uh, which is sampled from this distribution. And we can use that as an input to the, to the second part, the decoder of the network, which is the, the G uh, in, in the, the nomenclature previously here. Uh, and, and kind of what, what's nice about that is, that is that we can sample several different uh, images from the same representation. So the representation, you have distribution, and you can you can kind of see the variance in this representation by sampling many pixels, many pictures. So again, here we have uh, the context sizes. These are two different images, uh, and the columns are are the context sizes. So on the on the left one here, we have 
I think two pixels. No, it's two pixels. Or it's perhaps even more. Um, but it's a few pixels here. And then we have some more, and then we have some more, and then we have even more. And then uh, the lines, the first one is, of course, the context or the observations. The second line is one, uh, is one picture generated from one of these samples from the R. And the third line is, is another picture that's sampled from the same uh, distribution, so the same R. But we have a new Z, and then we decode from that. Uh, so the different lines here, you, you, you can kind of see some variability in, in the model. And then the, the right half here, we have the same thing, uh, but with, with, with the handwritten digits in the MNIST. And, and perhaps the MNIST example here is, is perhaps the, the, the nicer one, because um, I think on the third column here, you have something that, that sometimes looks like a three and sometimes looks like a seven, uh, a bit warped, perhaps. Um, so it, it shows this, this where, where is the model confident and where is it not, and, and how much variability is there in, in, in this prediction. Right. I, I mentioned uh, um, future learning, and the Omniglot data set is, is a data set for this. Uh, so we have these, um, these uh, characters in 50 different uh, alphabets from different languages. And we have 1,623 classes. That is, we have that many characters, uh, and we have only 20 examples per class. So this is a fairly useful data set for, for this task. And uh, how the model is applied to this is what you can see in this picture. Uh, so we show it a number of, of images. Now it's, it's five different ones. Uh, and we tell it that this is the first class, second, third, fourth, and fifth class. Uh, we put it through age and get these representations. We uh, aggregate them to an R, and then we make a prediction of three entirely unseen pictures. And, uh, and then uh, this is a classification task, so we have this, this categorical, categorical output, generally modeled as a softmax in a neural network. Uh, and, well, as they say in the paper, you can actually see in these, in these predictions how confident it is and that it is more confident when it sees pictures that has been that have kind of been, been demonstrated to it. Uh, but it can actually uh, generalize to entirely unseen uh, classes. Um, and and uh, this is the second uh, quantitative evaluation in the paper out of two. Uh, so there there aren't that much. But, but, and also here we have the, the matching networks, that's MN from Vignoles et al, uh, 2015, I think. Uh, it actually outperforms uh, this model by a tiny bit. Uh, but they kind of uh, sell it as, as we have the better runtime, because it's N plus M here in the, in the neural processes. Um, so for training, we have, we have a distinct number of classes. We have 1,200 classes randomly selected from the data set, and then we have the rest of the data set uh, that is the test testing uh, classes then. So all, uh, every example of these 400, 423 uh, classes were not used during the training. But the model is still able to to compute the representations and and uh, make the predictions on them. Right. So this is actually my my last slide. Um, how general uh, can you make these these the data, and how general class of functions can you can you learn to model here? Um, I actually don't know. But, but the, the data sets that, that has been used here 
those are, are at least fairly uh, nar narrow. It's, it's handwritten digits in the MNIST and Omnigot, and it is, it is the facial images in the Celeb A uh, data set. I still think it, it demonstrates something, something pretty cool uh, in, in the way that, that you generalize uh, from data. Also, they, they, they admit that, that these, uh, these experiments are fairly simple, and you have fairly simple uh, instantiations of this class of models. Um, so how complicated can, can you make them? Uh, as, I guess those are open questions, and I don't really know the answer to them. Perhaps you do. Have a question. So yes. They apply these things uh, into this uh, image recognition. So how can you make it uh, uh, sitting in variance? Because if you see just one pixel to the left, to the right, then you have a completely different sort of function uh, distribution. Uh, yes, I guess so. But 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 we still we're still here. We're looking at images that that the model hasn't ever seen, right? Just one percent to the left of your mm -hmm. You have completely different. You have an answer. You have an adversarial example, perhaps. Uh, okay, so I guess that's that's a good question. I, they, there is no results on that. Uh, I would assume that that since you can uh, generalize here to in completely unseen classes, that you could actually also generalize to to pictures that are shifted. If, uh, I mean, H could be an neural network, I suppose, so, I mean, it could be a CNN, so, which don't think have problems with shifting. Yes. Yes, you're right. And yet again, also, also models that are based on combinants, they, they are susceptible to, to adversarial examples, like these, these um, like you have seen in autonomous driving examples, where you, you put some noise in a, in a stop sign, it's no longer a stop sign. Um, I don't know, actually, but 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 we're taking some kind of a step towards more generalization, or kind of a, a, a step back and gen generalizing a bit more. Uh, that's one of the things that I I think it's nice about this. I think that's also nice about about meta learning in general and and learning to learn. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure I've actually understood it at all. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, if you have the same model age here, yes. that given all possible classes, we will generate some form of embedding. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it will still be in the same embedding space, yes. right? And then you take all possible outputs from all possible classes and average those into a shared representation and shared embedding or, or mean embedding. Mm. Uh, that's the part I I don't really get in in terms of uh, how this works later on. I mean, how do you get from that mean embedding space mm. into actually the prediction phase here? I just don't see it. <laughs> and and especially if you consider how does it really differentiate? as compared to variation about encoder. So, so in most of these uh, examples, it is not variational. It's just the one with where, where you called it latent. Mm -hmm. um, but um, otherwise, you just, you just have the representation that is a mean of all these representations. And I guess kind of the intuition is that when you train this end-to-end, and the gradients start flowing. Um, I guess the takeaway message is that, that you can actually learn an, a, an R that is useful. Um, I don't know if you can get a better, a more detailed intuition about that. No, I'm just, I'm, I just, I mean, from my perspective, in the observation phase, or whatever you want to call it, the observed part, I mm -hmm. mean, that sounds like a, Classical variation about encoding, right? But it's not variational. 
Didn't you talk about? It's an encoder, though. Uh, I did talk about variation uh, autoencoders. Uh, so there was one experiment where you had the latent variable yeah. that was trained like uh, a variation autoencoder. This is this is not. It's just backprop the whole way. Okay. But uh, because you're. But it you're is an encoder the, and a decoder. You still get the mean and variance uh, part, which I would assume comes from the variation of part of things. I do think that, that that's modeled at the output uh, stage, mm -hmm. and uh, and so I do think that for the real valued outputs, you have one output that is the mean and one output that is the variance, mm -hmm. and you can train that using using the, the standard uh, PDF for for Gaussian uh, univariate Gaussian, uh, and it actually starts learning the variance. Uh, here it is trained. It is trained for with, with the with the categorical and and so so the kind of the uncertainty here is more like on, on the last one here where you have more of a flatter distribution of the classes. Uh, so so I think that's how they get the variance out of out of the outputs. Uh, so so it's only the R one to through R five. Those are just standard vectors. Uh, I don't remember the, the, the dimensionality in this experiment, but they, they used some different dimensionalities in the different experiments. But yeah, how can that be used to, to generalize to clauses that you have never seen? Um, yeah, I guess that's the cool part. And perhaps the, the part that is, that is a bit difficult to grasp. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not sure I can give any no, better. No, it's, it's me that is slow. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. Mm -hmm. if, if I understood the question, I think it's similar to something that's called under the base, where you use a related data set to form your prior, and then you use that as a prior, so you don't just create the prior, but you use some related data, and yes. you form a prior from that. Yes, so, so that is that is very much what they do. Yes, uh, instead of handcrafting the, the priors as you do with with kind of designing your Gaussian processes, uh, here you're you're learning some way of a representation of a prior. Yes. So you don't understand when you compare it to the common the usual Gaussian processes. Mm -hmm. Then I guess the Gaussian process doesn't use all of this training data. They just see picture, or can you use the Training data to improve the cost and process you can track. So, so they compare with something that has seen a lot less mm -hmm. information. I, I guess so. Um, I actually don't really know about the Gaussian processes. Uh, can the Gaussian kernels be be learned? I think there might be some some way to use some some prior stuff, but I think it's the, 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 the most common way is to use something like. Uh, Maximum likelihood to, to pick, pick the parameters, mm -hmm. um, and then perhaps you can use they're not the, the rest of the data to that. But I mean, if it's the usual Gaussian process, then you just see the, the function with some yes. some places also. Yes. So so you could definitely and and they they they're not saying they're using some special form of Gaussian process, but it, it seems to be that they're using this the standard. Regular Gaussian process, and and in that way, I guess you're right. It's not really a fair comparison, and it's actually pretty cool that the Gaussian process actually outperforms these methods in, when you have a large context. Uh, but yet again, I guess I guess when you have thousand pixels given here, it shouldn't be that difficult to to predict the last ten or so pixels. I don't know. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I'll, I'll try. Are they writing anything? Um, yeah, um, thanks for them. They, they left the channel, I think. Okay. So we'll see if they have question. some questions on the phone. They want to be included. <laughs> Don't write in the chat, so that's cool. They can't? I can't. Oh, you can't. You have no idea. But they can. They can. That's really 
protein. Okay. I guess that means that they left the room. They left the chat. Can you see if they if they are on the uh, on if they're watching if they're still watching? Okay, so people are watching. Hmm. I can see I can see the discussions here. Okay. Tack för oss i kista. You can look at the interaction the next time. All right. All right. Uh, so back to the discussion here. We have more more things to discuss. More questions. More more question marks with this paper. So the ev evaluations are surely one of the one of the weaker things with this. And uh, as it is with, with all also the, the, the work in, in generative models for, for images, uh, I mean, you can always show pretty pictures, and, and that's nice, I guess. But, but uh, it doesn't really prove much, I guess. And, and also, uh, I guess, we don't really know what, what is, how useful is this, this output. Um, but it's, I guess it's it's nice with some qualitative results as well. You can see that it that it kind of goes from the blurry one to the more detailed one. Um, I guess, I guess as as the quantitative results said that when you go further here, uh, you don't get the actual detailed uh, output that you do from from the baselines. Uh, when, when the Gaussian process starts to outperform this. But perhaps you get some, some kind of better generalization as well. Yeah? I mean, one, one thing that I suspect where it would be very useful to have is this instance in reinforcement learning. If you want to do safe exploration, Example, mm -hmm. which you really can do today with this um, uh, model free uh, approaches. Okay, how would you do that? I mean, since you have the confidence in talking about stuff, you can figure out whether in, if you would use this network as a model based approach mm -hmm. uh, and you try to kind of uh, play your model forwards in terms of figuring out what happens. Mm -hmm. By using your confidence, you can figure out whether uh, how how sure am I that the output the outcome will be whatever it will be if I follow a certain policy. Mm. Uh, I mean, today I think most model-based ones are based on Gaussian processes. Okay. Uh, which doesn't really scale to Atari games and so. On. Mm. So that would be the killer app. <laughs> Actually, the, 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 the yeah. stop killing app. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's the one thing. I mean, I mean, in terms of a practical approach here for image completion, I mean, it's a kind of contrived them. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. So you have the means all over the place. Of course, I guess the prediction could be actually seen as that image plus the means for the unobserved pixels. I guess that's how it's probably evaluated. So I'm going to do this for the, uh, uh, for your blood sugar data. That, that, that yeah, could be an experiment. Speaking, yeah. Sometimes there's data code. Uh, that, it could be could be used for that, I guess. Um, also, I guess the question is, could we or should we use a recurrent neural network for that within this this uh, kind of training training realm? I guess we could do that. 
but we haven't <laughs> yet. Right? More questions? Yeah. I, I was just thinking, uh, well, uh, because we can just think of it, but uh, uh, this model uh, particularly good, particularly bad uh, for, let's say, extrapolation. Uh, I mean, if we kind of go outside of the regions where we have seen examples. Yeah. That's I, I, also I, I just had this thought after uh, uh, Chris Dyer's invited talk last week where he showed that uh, uh, if you train neural networks to imitate an identity function, so usually uh, these networks cannot extrapolate. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, is, is that a different thing as compared to... Yeah, is what you mean you can extrapolate where, where you haven't seen any examples of, of functions? Them, uh, because because all these functions, of course, they have been defined on on this input. Uh, so yeah, but then I, I guess uh, it's a good question. How will the, the generated image look here? I guess there, there are no mathematical problems with evaluating it outside of this region. Um, I mean, it is an interpolation from, from this pixel uh, to the context of that, but then you have seen you have seen functions that were defined on that space. Right? I guess this, uh, this is uh, the training data is phases. So if yes. it's an uh, animal data set, uh, if they see a one dot, it will become an uh, animal. It, it will. Yeah, so. Yes. Exactly. So, so that, is, uh, I, that is one of my questions. How, how general can you make, can we make this training? When you can and I guess that also depends see. on the capacity of the model. model. Um, so if you have a large capacity model and you have a lot of training data, then I guess you could have, you could start to have a more general uh, training set. And perhaps you could train it with both faces and animals. Uh, and it, of course, seeing one pixel, it would, it would be really uh, unsure whether this is an animal or a face. Uh, but after seeing a few pixels, perhaps it's, it's it, I mean, I guess that would be more of a question of trainability and, and how big capacity can you, can you use. I think we're, we're kind of out where all my answers are to mostly speculation. Also, or, or interpolation, I'm outside of the function definition. Right, I think perhaps we say goodbye to YouTube now. Goodbye. And say, oh. Here, stop transmitting.